So, guys, we've been talking about discipleship and what it truly means for us to be disciples. Jesus says in Matthew 28, he wants to go to all nations, all nations and baptize in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we want uh, each one of you to know that God is for us. God's with us. And he is actually um, teaching us on how to live in relationship with him. So um, the focus today is for us to, to go deep in God. Everybody say these words with me. Believe Jesus. So believe Jesus is what this is all about. We started off this session. We last week uh, we covered uh, from Matt, from John chapter six, verse 41 up to 58. So today we're going to pick up on verse 59. So if you're in John chapter six, verse 59, that's where we're going to pick up today. So here in verse 59, it says these things Jesus said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So what were the things that Jesus taught in the Capernaum? We're getting ready to get to those in just a second. It says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So the promise that what we've got going on here today is Jesus had just finished up talking about what was the hard saying. The first thing that he said that was hard for them is that he said that he was the bread that came down from heaven. So many of you know of somebody from right across town that's lived over here on Arrow Street or on Odell Street. They said to you, hey, listen, I'm going to be the one that's going to give eternal life and I'm going to give you resurrection. And, and if you if you eat of my, of my body and you drink of my blood, that I'm going to allow you to abide with me and, I, and you're going to and, and I'll abide with you. Or if you if they said to you, listen. You're going to live by what I give you and you would you would have some questions or concerns with it, wouldn't you? So the disciples, they had some questions and they said, this is a this is a hard saying. First of all, Jesus, who's lived right over here in Galilee, he's saying that he is uh, the son of God. He's saying that 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 the heaven that if we invite him into our life, that we're going to have eternal life. How is it that he's saying these things? Matter of fact, we know his mom and daddy. We know. Joseph and we know Mary and we know his sisters and brothers that are all here with us. So how is it that he's trying to get us to believe that he's someone different? And what I want you to understand is they skip past the fact of what Jesus had demonstrated to them. What Jesus had demonstrated to them and what Jesus had demonstrated was miracles and signs and wonders that there were blind eyes open. There was deaf ears that heard. There were the lame that walked. There was the leprous conditions that were restored and they skip past all of those things to say, hey, listen, this is a this is a hard saying for us. So I'm quest challenging everybody in this room. If we look back at our life and the life experiences and time that we spent with Jesus in the situations where we didn't know how it was going to work out or turn out and God showed up to make things right for us, are we going to look back at those situations and say, hey, listen, if it hadn't been for God, I don't know where I would be. And so what we want to do is not do what these disciples do. And let's see the second point that we see here. It says that uh, that uh, Jesus, he knows every single one of our thoughts and every single one of our words. And and what he doesn't want us to do is to become offended. And so when we, Jesus knows everything that we're thinking and every 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 uh, word that we ever look at, every word that we would ever have in our hearts and our minds. Uh, we don't want to be offended by that. And this word offended, it means a word that means to snare or to be a stumbling block uh, in the way of. So in John 6, 61, we see Jesus saying these words. So it says that Jesus knew in himself that the disciples, they complained about this. And he said unto them, does this offend you? So the disciples complained about who he said he was and who he, he promised to be, to be the bread of life coming down for heaven. They had concern with the fact that Jesus is now promising them eternal life. He's promising to abide with them. They had concern with the fact that he's saying he's from a different place. And he says, does this offend you? Is this a snare for you? So oftentimes with us, we look at Jesus that way and we shouldn't. But sometimes there's a situation or circumstance that arises in our heart that causes us to be offended. Maybe it's been a time or season on our life that we believe God for something that God was going to show up, that God was going to change the situation. And when the situation doesn't change in our timing, we get, we get what? We get offended, baby. Hey, Jesus, I'm mad. My daughter, Jasmine, she getting married. I keep telling y'all this, but she getting married October the 19th. But man, she was little, maybe two or three. You know, she would, 
She, we had these big old pots with the tree, like the tree in them, a big old uh, indoor tree and big old flower pots. And Jasmine, she was little, like she could crawl up on the side of it. She would start raking that dirt out. And, you know, we we say, no, no. You know, she would leave and, you know, for long, she'd be over there raking it out again. But my point is, that like, when she was little and she didn't get her way, she would fold her arms and stick out her lip. Oh, man. You know. That was her thing. And so this is what Jesus is saying to us. When we don't get what we want, when we want it, will we be like these disciples and think that we know and understand everything that Jesus is supposed to say and do? And, and, and will we change from being offended to just accepting the fact, hey, listen, this is going to happen in God's time. And so these disciples, they felt like, hey, listen, there's certain things Jesus can say and certain things he can't. He can't say that he's from heaven because we can't prove it, even though we've seen him do all his work. It says that they were still offended. Point number four is what, it, what will it take for you and I to believe? Jesus, he then says to the same disciples that he spent day in and day out and week in, week out, month in and month out praying with them and them seeing him do all the miracles that he's done, that these same guys are now offended by what he's saying and what he's proven to them. And, and he says, what is it going to take for you to believe? And he's saying to them, if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before, will that make you believe? He says, if you see me begin to levitate off the ground, if you see me cross through the clouds, if you see me go out of sight, Will that cause you to believe? And y'all know that Jesus, he went on to do this very thing. But he's saying to him, what is it going to take for you to believe? Like I've done all this other stuff. You've seen the blind eyes open. You've seen the lame walk. You've seen the leprous conditions here. You've seen the dead raised. You've seen all these things happen. What else is it going to take for you to believe? So the question becomes for us, what is it going to take for us to believe how we've taken into consideration the things that Jesus has done for us? The things that Jesus has done for us and are we willing to accept those things as evidence that God loves us and that he sent his son for us. The next point we want to focus on is the words of Jesus are alive. Everybody say alive. alive. The words of Jesus are alive. Jesus in here in John 6, 63, he says this. It is the spirit that gives life. My flesh profits nothing. He says the words that I speak to you. Our spirit and they are life. Jesus, when he speaks, it happens. Like what changes Jesus, what makes Jesus different from everyone else is his ability for his words to happen. You know, even Jesus, when there was a man that came here in John, I think chapter four, there was a man that came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I want you to come to my house because my son is sick of the fever and he's going to die. And Jesus says, spoke the word and said when he spoke the words, the condition of the son changed, even though Jesus was not physically at his residence. That man's son was instantly healed. He was at the point of death. But because Jesus spoke it, his condition changed. So the question becomes to us in this room. Are we willing to allow the words of Jesus to transform our life? If our life is filled with, with uh, uh, w war and stress and pain and suffering and agony and disappointment, discouragement, are we willing to allow the words of Jesus? And John 14 says, my peace I give unto you, right? Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And sometimes fear will back us in a corner. Sometimes fear will want us to... To back down, are we gonna are we gonna do this very thing and allow the words of Jesus as we apply them to our life? Things begin to happen. I heard a testimony uh, of a pastor, but I heard a, another testimony of a lady who was totally and completely healed of stage four cancer. And, and her testimony was that she she began to open up the Word of God and read all the healing scriptures and, and began to speak those healing scriptures over herself. And she was down to eighty something pounds and. She was, she was sure enough die, going to die, and God told her, listen, I want you to begin to forgive everybody that's ever offended you, and I want you to pray for them. And, I, and she began to read these scriptures over her life about it's by Jesus' stripes that we're healed, and every single day her condition got a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. My point is that we don't understand how it works, but everything that we see around us that we can taste, heal, 
taste, touch, smell, and even those things that are, aren't pr present, we can sense them and we can feel them. If I just start yelling and screaming at somebody in, in, this, in this room and, and God in their face, nose to nose and all belligerent and told them how much I hated them and all that kind of stuff. Now, we, we, those words, those words that I'm releasing, like you can't see them. But if I was that person that was disrespecting somebody like that in a public setting in front of all of you, you would feel what? Humiliated. You would feel rejected. All those things, even though we don't see them, you can feel them. And what those are, they are spirits. So when we have someone in our life that's speaking those kind of words over us, we have to recognize that we got to replace those words. And what do we replace those words with? We replace them with Jesus' words. And we have to say to ourselves, what God says about us. And when we say those words of our life, our conditions will change. Everybody say Jesus' words, Jesus words. are alive. Next point we want to know and understand is Jesus is getting ready to talk about his disciples. And he says there are two things that we need to know as disciples. It says that Jesus knew every single one of his disciples that believed in him and even the ones that would betray him. So this word means to place, believe means to place confidence in or to place trust in and, and a betrayal means to give over to like he knew like who it was that he'd invested his life in and actually received and understood and appreciated all that he'd done for them and was going to remain faithful to him until the end. But in John 6 64 it says this, there were there, and, but there are some of you, Jesus still speaking, that do not believe. And he says that for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who they were that would betray him. And what had happened is Jesus had called and chosen his 12. And now he's got another 70 disciples that, and, uh, that, that, uh, that said, listen, we're going we're gonna to come follow you too. We, we're going we're gonna to get ourselves in on this. We haven't seen anybody do the things that you're doing. But Jesus, even though that they wanted to follow him, he knew who it was that was going to be with him and who, who it was is going to believe in him, but who it was is going to turn that back on him. So what we need to know and understand is whatever's in our heart, if we've got any reservations in our heart, that is Jesus knows everything that we're facing, everything that we're dealing with, everything that's going to push us to the limit, everything that's going to say, make us say, hey, listen, this is as far as I can go with you, Jesus. I can't go anymore. He knows our hearts. So what we want to do is be what, do what King David done when he says, Lord, search me, know me. See if there's any unrighteous thing in me. Like, God, I want you to look at me. And if there's anything in me that offends you, God, I want to give it over to you. And, and Jesus knows our hearts. Everybody say our hearts. He knows what's in it, so let's just reveal it to him. The next thing that we have to see about Jesus teaching and his disciples, it, he goes on to tell them something that's even going to offend them more. He says that nobody can come unto me unless the Father give him. So one of the things that we need to do is we have to pray to be given to Jesus by the Father. We have to pray for that. Here it is in John 6, 65. It says, and he said, therefore, uh, I said unto you that no man can come unto me unless he's been granted to him by my father. So oftentimes we think, hey, listen, I'm just here because my grandmama came to church. I, I'm here because my best friend invited me. I'm here in Marshall because God, God woke me up and, you know, gave me. And like, you know, we, we, we think that we're here because it's all about us. But what this is really saying to us is the only reason that we come into relationship with God is because of all the things that God has put in place in front of us that God has granted us to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. So our prayer must be that everyone that we love, that God will give them that same opportunity that he gave us. I said, I don't know how it happened in my family. We got the God ones and <clears throat> the God ones. We got the good name, don't we? God win. You can't get no better than that. G-O-D-W-I-N. Ain't that a good last name? You can't even get away from God, even if you will. You can't even deny him or betray him. Like you, you got God in your name. You got to be something that, you know, represent God. And I, I'm just here to confess that the God ones, they wasn't necessarily the kind of people that was representing the name well. You know what I'm saying? Like they were getting a shootout with your good fist fighter to drop a hat. And my daddy told me a story about some of his uncles being outlaw. But my point is, it's like they had the name, but they didn't have the relationship. And what God wants us to know and understand is that we come to the Father and it's because God has placed people in our path to lead us. And I don't know how it is that they started our little country church. My grandpa, my, my mama's people, they love God and 
My grandma uh, that was married to my grandfather on the Godwin side, she's a Pentecostal woman. She probably prayed me into the kingdom praying in tongues. But my point is, is that we come into relationship because of all the people that God has brought down our path and God gave me the revelation. Like, man, how would you have come to know Jesus if your grandpa's hadn't planted that little church out in the country? About seven people came to, you know, uh, eight or ten. How would you come to know Jesus if your cousin Cynthia Hill that wouldn't have taught Sunday school? How would you come to know Jesus when you got in high school and you go in there and she would let you teach sometime and give you a taste for what it was to serve God? And how would you come to Jesus if it hadn't been for you going to Missouri State and your teammates inviting you to come to church with them? How would you come to know Jesus if one of your teammates who you thought was invincible just like you were, wasn't killed in a car crash. If you, God hadn't done all these things to cause the light of understanding for me to wake up and say, listen, there's a place called eternity that all of us are going to. And I have to know that God has placed these things in order to get my attention because I had every intent of being in that truck with my teammate going across Oklahoma that flipped over and ejected him. And I guarantee you, I wouldn't have had my seatbelt on either. But God gave me another chance. How many chances has God given you? What things have God kept from you that the enemy wanted to send to destroy your life? And Jesus says, listen, I want you to know and understand something. The only way that you can come into relationship with me is you got to have the father drawing you to me, the father granting you. And so we want to pray that prayer for this church. We want to pray that prayer for our families. We want to pray that prayer for this city. We want to pray that prayer for this county. We want to pray that prayer for this state and this nation. That, that We all need God drawing us, don't we? We all need God drawing us. We all need him drawing us. Next point we want to see is that Jesus, he experienced rejection. Everybody say rejection. So the disciples, they heard what he had to say. They heard, hey, listen, I, you can't come. We can't come to you unless the Father draws. As a matter of fact, we... We're going to be offended by it. Look at this verse. Ain't this a good chapter number and verse for us to see? Anybody know them three numbers, huh? It's a good chapter number and verse saying that y'all, y'all see John 6, 66. Woo. Look at what these words say. It says, from that time, many of his disciples, <laughs> they went back. They went back and walked with him no more. From that time that they heard, you can't even come to me unless the Father sends you. They were offended. It says many of them went back and walked no more with him, even though they had been with Jesus and they had seen him do all the marvelous works that they experienced. They still went back to what they had before. So what that tells me is even if we see miracles and signs and wonders and deaf ears open right here in Life Church, there will be someone that will find offense with God in some capacity and walk away from the bread of life himself, the peace of God, the joy, the love of God himself, and go back to doing the old things that they were doing before. And the challenge for us is, is, is that are we going to are we going to allow anything to get between our relationship? With God, and I love this next point. It says that that is our heart, is our heart and our soul, mind and strength with with Jesus. Is our heart, soul, mind and strength with Jesus? And what makes us ask that question? This verse does, because Jesus said to his disciples, He says, uh, "Listen, do you want to also go away?" He's like, "Here's a seventy that been following me. They seen everything that you've seen. Is there something in your life? Is there something in you that makes you think, hey, 'Hey, I'm not good enough, and you need to leave me too'? Do you want to?" Do you want to go away? Like it's so the question becomes to us, are we are we truly connected with Jesus in our heart, soul, mind and strength? You know, sometimes our mouth can say things uh, that we love God and our heart can believe certain things. And in our soul, we can have our will directed for, towards God. And our mind can sometimes think godly thoughts and, and our strength can, can us doing things that we could be serving God faithfully. But are we are we truly with God and we allowing him to to be the Lord of our life and all these different angles and all these different d- dimensions. Are we, are we saved in our finances and saved in our marriage and saved in our relationships and saved in the workplace and saved in public? Every say somebody see us, are we representing that we have Jesus with us and he's leading and guiding our life. And the final thing that we see here 
that Peter goes into is about his personal experience with Christ and his personal relationship with Jesus. And he begins to describe who Jesus was to him because Peter had his own personal relationship. And John 6, 68, it says, and Peter said, answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. So he said, listen, we we've seen a lot in this region, but we never seen you. We never seen anyone come through here like you. We never seen anyone teach and preach like you. Matter of fact, he says, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Like we know that you're anointed. We know that the things that we've witnessed has been because God's power has rested on you. We know that for you to be able to speak to the winds and the wave and command the storms and stand still, for you to be able to walk on water like we just seen you do this past week, we, we know that there's something different about you. We know that you're not an ordinary man and we choose to go with you. We choose to believe you. We choose to follow you. We choose to place our trust, our hope and our confidence in you. Because you are who you say you are to us, and that's out of personal relationship. Everybody say personal relationship. One of the things that helped me is just jotting down what the things that God has revealed to me and the things that God has shown me and taking inventory of the good things that God has done in my life. Verse 70, Jesus goes on to say this. He said, Jesus answered and said, did I not choose you 12 and one of you is the devil? And I like this because Jesus says, I'm going to make difference. I, I'm coming here to earth. I'm coming here to earth to give my life for all of humanity. I'm coming here to die on the cross to pay for everyone's sins. I'm coming here that I'm establishing God's kingdom here on earth. I'm coming here because I'm bringing heaven and earth. We says, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He says, when you pray, I want you to pray these words. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus came to establish those very things right here. But now we see this says, I'm one of you guys has got the devil. And let's see who it is. It's this guy named Judas, right? That even though Jesus was going to give his life, Judas says, says Hi, I'm going I'm to get involved in helping the people that's going to take you to the cross. I mean, you didn't have to do that. Like, Jesus was going to do it anyway. He was going to the cross. And it says, for um, it was Judas who betrayed Jesus being one of the 12. And so the challenge for us today, the challenge for us today is will we choose to believe Jesus? Or will, will we allow the challenges that we face in life? The words that we hear to cause us to betray Jesus and to walk away from him. Will we allow the things that we experience in life? So, Pastor Bobby, can't you be more positive? Well, I'm positive. You're going to have some things come at you. I'm positive there's going to be some situations come at your marriage. I'm positive that you're going to have some financial situations. I'm positive that you're going to have some kind of health condition that the enemy is going to try to bring at you to break you. I'm positive that it's going to be some things that's going to, going to come at you and cause you to feel rejected and say, hey, God, if you was really with me, I wouldn't feel this lonely and isolated. I'm actually trying to live right for once. You know, I Used to be out there in the streets, but now, God, you see me. I'm trying to go to church every Sunday. And look, look at all these bad things happening. My car won't start. The kids got in trouble at school. Now they're talking about turning my water off. Oh, God, I've been serving you faithfully these last six months. God, would you please, like, why is this happening to me? I, I'm, I'm trying to live right. I'm reading my Bible every day. I even watch Pastor Bobby on live stream, God. I mean, there's going to be things that come at us. And I'm saying it jokingly, but you guys know I'm not joking. The more good we try to do, we have to know that there's an adversary that's opposing us. But one of the wonderful things is, is that God gives his angels charge concerning us, doesn't he? To bear us up lest we dash our foot against the stone. And so here's what the enemy will want us to do. He would want us to live in this rejected state. And with the fact that Jesus, he came and he was rejected by his own disciples is an indication there will be people in your life that you will invest a great deal in that will turn their backs on you, that will betray you, that will turn you over and you won't know what happened or why they done it 
or, or, or what you've done wrong, but what we have to do in order to not allow that, that, that rejection to build a wall around us. And when we build that wall of rejection around us to say, hey, we're never going to allow that to happen again, we build a wall between us and God and between us and those individuals. And as long as we allow rejection to, um, to manifest itself and be in control of our life, we will never move into the true relationship that God has for us. We'll try to fill our life up with other things. We'll try to fill our life up with relationships with people. Maybe if I was just married to the right person that this would, I wouldn't feel this way. Oh, we'll try to fill our life up with materials. Maybe if I had more stuff, you know, that this, I wouldn't feel this way, but whatever we try to use to fill that void that's in our life, there's nothing that's ever going to fill the void that uh, has been created by this spirit of rejection. And Jesus showed us, giving us an example here today. He didn't, uh, when his disciples cursed him, I just, his disciples walked away from him. He didn't say one word about, you know, we don't see one word where Jesus says, listen, every single one of you guys is leaving me. I'm causing all kind of bad stuff to happen to you, baby. You're going to get you gonna get a little taste of God's medicine. No, we don't see that. But Jesus demonstrated what we have to demonstrate if we truly want to walk in right relationship with God. It's every single person, every situation where we felt rejected. If we never heard our mother, our father say we loved us. I love Pastor Julie sharing that. I begged my daddy. I was 30 something years old and I never heard him say I love you, you know. Never heard of him. He's, a, he's one of the manly men from way back there in the 1920s. You know what I'm saying? They, they didn't tell nobody they loved him. I mean, I don't know where they came from, but that ain't from God. I kiss my girls. I got four of them. I kiss them and tell them how much I love them all the time. I'm, I always have. And, and so my point is, is that Jesus demonstrated forgiveness to the people that hurt him. And in order for us to truly walk, and where God wants us to, we have to choose to forgive those people that hurt us. And matter of fact, all I have to do is just have you think about the people that have hurt you and you know what happens. You can feel the stress. You can feel the anxiety. You can feel the, all those emotions start to um, boil over because there's something left. And honestly, what I choose to do is every single time that thought comes to mind, I take it to Jesus 100% of the time that God, I don't want to feel this way about Pastor John. I love him. <laughs> Pastor John hadn't done nothing. But I don't want to feel that way about Pastor John. I love him. I don't want to feel that way about Marcia. I love her. I don't want to feel, you know, I'll go down the list. I don't want to feel that way. And the devil will try to come back at you. I tell you what, they, they, they read you the right act. I say, yep, God, I don't want to feel that way about them, right? And if we will just give it to God, and not keep it to ourselves, not try to figure out how to do it ourselves. We'll give all that rejection to God and God will lift that burden and he'll cause us to walk in his peace. Let's stand to our feet and we want to pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for us having this opportunity to come before you today and to recognize that, that, that you walk through rejection just like we do and we are and you chose not to curse those disciples that left you, that you've invested so much of your time and effort and your spirit and your teaching and um, food and you clothe them. You've done everything that they needed for the season that they were in with you and they decided to walk away and they rejected you. And God, we don't want to be those kind of people. We want to stay with you regardless and be faithful to you because we've made personal commitment, personal relationship with you and you have kept us from walking away. So Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you'd also cause us just to, to give to you every form of rejection that we've ever experienced. And we pray in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus that you would ease those pains and take away the pain that we feel in our heart right now. We choose to trust you. We choose to give every painful situation over to you. Every, every person that's rejected us in a church or in our workplace, any friends or in our family, God, we want to give those situations all over to you in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Now, Father, I want to pray for every person that's here that maybe have not accepted you as Lord and Savior, has given their life to you. I pray, God, that you just cause this to be their moment. There's a place called eternal life that you prepared for us uh, that trust you and believe in you and accept the free gift of salvation and accept your blood that was shed for our sins. But there's also a place called eternal damnation, a place where everything that's unlike God exists, every form of pain and suffering and agony and, and um, 
torment, God, is in that place. And God, we choose today to accept the free gift of eternal life that comes out of relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're here in this room and you've never said uh, yes to Jesus, we're asking you to do that. This is not a yes to life, church. It's a yes to the relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm simply going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three and we'll pray a simple prayer together and God's going to cause your life to be transformed because you've accepted the free gift of His Son's blood for your sins. There's nothing that you can add to the blood of Jesus nothing that you can add to the blood of Jesus. And there's no sin that you've ever committed that's more powerful than his blood. So he's going to forgive you. He's going to erase all the shame and all the fear and the rejection and everything that you felt that the enemy's tried to heap on you, any bitterness towards people that have hurt you. He's breaking all that off now in the name of Jesus. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. We're going to pray together. One, two, three. Just raise your hands in there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your blood that was shed for my sins. I receive the, the free gift of salvation that you paid for for me. Transform my life from this moment on. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. All right, let's just give those who accepted Christ a great big hand clap.